OK, so good afternoon and welcome to this meeting of the Randwick Local Planning Panel. The time being 1.02 p.m. I'll declare the meeting open. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the various lands we occupy for this meeting, the Aboriginal people, their spirits and ancestors. We pay our respects to Elders past and present and emerging. The meeting today is to consider the determination of four development applications. The panel members for these matters are myself, Lindsay Fletcher, as the chair, Heather Wharton and Peter Romy as the independent expert members and the community member, Michelle Finnegan. Uh, this meeting is being held by video conference due to the COVID-19 precautions. As the panel chair, I'm requesting that you be considerate and respectful of each other and remain on mute until I ask you to speak. I also request that you don't interject while another person is speaking. Otherwise, I will have to request that you no longer be part of the meeting. The panel operates in terms of a code of conduct and operating guidelines, which have been modified to facilitate the effective functioning of the panel. Temporary changes are available on Council's website, as indeed are the code of conduct and the operating guidelines. Uh, this public meeting will be recorded and the recording will be placed on the Council's website following the meeting. If that is of concern to you on privacy grounds, then I suggest you take it into consideration in your decision to make a public statement before the panel today. In terms of the code, general declarations of interest have been provided before the meeting by all panel members, as well as a specific declaration of interest in relation to the matters being considered today. I can confirm that all declarations of interest have been received. Heather Wharton has declared a non-pecuniary, reasonably perceived conflict of interest in relation to item three and item four because of a person because a personal friend of hers made a written submission on both those items. That person isn't addressing the panel today. But nevertheless, Heather will accordingly will not attend or participate in discussions or deliberations on those two items. No other members of the panel have declared a conflict of interest on any item for determination at this meeting. Um, the signed declarations will be available to view through the Council's website by tomorrow afternoon. I also wish to advise that all members of the public addressing the panel today must declare, prior to commencing their address, any political contributions or donations exceeding $1,000 made over the past two years to any political party or candidate who contested the last ordinary election of council. Our usual practice is to allow each speaker three minutes to present, including speakers representing community groups, individuals and the applicant. If you have registered to speak, your address to the panel will be recorded. You'll be given a warning 30 seconds before your time limit and I have a limited discussion to allow extra time if appropriate. We will hear first from councillors, followed by members of the public, and then from the applicant in each matter. In each matter. The panel has been provided with a copy of all the submissions received in response to the public exhibition of the applications. Therefore, there is no need for speakers to repeat the points made in those submissions. I ask that each speaker be heard in silence while they're addressing the panel and that courtesy and respect be observed throughout this meeting. Oh, excuse me. There's to be no personal criticism directed at any speaker or council staff. Any such criticism would be contrary to the panel's code of conduct and will not be accepted. Panel members may ask questions of speakers to clarify their understanding of the points they are making. After hearing from all speakers, the panel will adjourn to debate the matters and make its determinations. If more information is required by the panel, the decision may be deferred either for a further public meeting or to be dealt with electronically. The panel decisions and recording will be made available on the Council's website as soon as possible, usually the following day. <laughs> Excuse me. There is to be no recording of this meeting other than the official recording. So we will now consider the each item um, in accordance with the uh, the printed agenda. The first item is 
104 Brook Street, Coogee, uh, DA 214 2022. We have four people registered to address the panel on this item and two experts on behalf of the applicant available to answer questions. I'll now invite our first speaker um, to present to us, and that is Councillor Cathy Nielsen. Councillor Nielsen. Thank you, Chair. I'm also speaking on behalf of Councillor Michael Olive. Our concerns relate principally to the hours of operation. We consider the hours proposed for a 12-month trial are very generous, so if the panel were of a mind to reduce the hours, we would support a reduction from the current proposed 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., Monday to Sunday, including public holidays. We support the 12-month trial period before any consideration is given to increasing the hours. We are we're also mindful that reporting issues can be difficult for residents, notwithstanding the best intentions of business operators. And it's noted that a consent condition has been recommended to ensure a compliance record and contact number is maintained during all hours of operation. But could the panel add a condition that the contact number be displayed in a prominent position so that nearby residents could use it if necessary? I'm thinking of the requirement similar to um, the contact pubs have near um, contact number near their entrance, which means anyone wanting to lodge a complaint has a contact number. That's what I'm referring to in terms of contact detail for complaints of noise, et cetera. Such a notice would need to be in a prominent location, not just in the basement in the, or in the car park. And could council also be requested to notify anyone who put in a submission of the contact number for complaints? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, we'll take on board those points. Uh, do panel members have any questions of the Councillor? I'm, I'm hearing no, so thank you for that. Thank um, you. We, as I say, we, we, um, I've, I've allowed an additional speaker um, in opposition. So we have two people registered to speak in uh, that are in opposition to the uh, recommendation um, and one uh, representing the applicant as well as uh, two experts, an acoustic expert and a town planner available to answer questions on behalf of the applicant. Just before I move to the objectors, um, I note that the applicant is represented by Jacinta Stoddart um, and I, Jacinta, I presume you're there, I can't see everybody, but um, uh, Jacinta I know is a lawyer and I assume she is appearing in that capacity. Um, under the panel's guidelines, a person isn't allowed to be legally represented um, unless approval is obtained from the through the chair. Um, and th the issue is whether in, in, in deciding that matter, I have to have regard to the nature and complexity of the matter um, and whether it involves a question of law, as well as the capacity of the person to represent themselves without legal representation. So, Jacinta, I would simply put you on notice that you will need to address that issue um, before you present to us um, in, a, in a little while. So, moving to our first. Um, objector, that's Mr. Richard Woodburn, and can I remind you, before speaking, you need to uh, say your name for the benefit of the recording and indicate whether or not you have made any relevant political donations. Mr. Woodburn? Yes, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Richard Woodburn, and I declare that I've made no political donations uh, in, recent, in the last two years. I speak as a chair of the Strata Committee of the Residents of Units Above the Gym. I'm also a retired civil engineer with a broad background, including traffic and as a representative on various traffic committees. An overall issue the committee and other residents are collectively concerned about is a number of statements in the assessment report and departures from the conditions of the consent applying to the Dan Murphy fed out under DA 215 of 215. These have been detailed in submission, so I won't deal with them in detail as requested. Our primary, our first issue relates to noise due to access and associated with the cavernous echo-like nature of the, the car park and the driveway. And that ex directly exposes 47 bedrooms to any noise from those areas. 
So we do not agree with any trial of the extended of extended hours under those circumstances. And we submit that the applicant should first demonstrate full compliance and lack of disturbance during the base hours of 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. before applying for any extension. Our second concern relates to parking or lack thereof. Under the previous DA, there was provision for 40 parking spaces, 25 for Den Murphy's, 10 for the basement area, assuming a retail usage, and five for a small cafe. Following a re reconfiguration are now 36. Even with Dan Murphy's operating, actual demand is quite significant. The other two tenancies aren't operating. The park, are, park, park is regularly at peak capacity and the parking full sign displayed and the trying traffic controllers by Dan Murphy's on occasions. The two new tenancies proposed have now much higher traffic generating potential. The cafe capacity was expanded to 50 patrons requiring 16 spaces under a complying development certificate um, which we had no input into and no knowledge of it, if it happening. The gym proposal now proposed uh, changes the usage from retail to, to other uses and requires 16 spaces up from 10 and another one set aside for a bike rack. Paid parking is also now available in that area and no provision was made in the original layout. The reports claims that parking demands do not, over, that do not overlap and therefore they can mount, swap spaces between the spaces. This is not feasible because the cafe has similar operating hours to the gym, 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. Or, or thereabouts. Dan Murphy's aim is at 9 a.m. but is staffed from 7 a.m. and there's generally five or six cars parked in the car park at that hours. The report also ambitiously recommends 16 spaces, sole use spaces for the gym, exclusively two for staff, 14 for customers. But apparently all the sharing is meant to be done by Dan Murphy's and the cafe, yet there are only 20 spaces available for them. Dan Murphy's DA requirements mandate 25 spaces. They just don't simply exist. The parking shortfall is not inconsequential. It's a major consideration. We're also concerned about noise and vibration and uh, we're mindful that when the small gym operated under the rugby club auspices, it was a regular nuisance for residents. The lack of direct access from the car park is a major consideration and it was highlighted in the assessment report as such. No pedestrian access was a requirement of the Dan Murphy development and it's signposted accordingly. The shared path creates a significant pedestrian vehicle conflict situation, goes against basic road safety principles. Pedestrians have to negotiate first the boom gates, then the Dan Murphy loading dock with reversing vehicles, the pinch point at the roller door, and then mixed with traffic along the driveway. The proposed condition is just not supported by the residents. Also a concern is the reduction in, in, in the fact that there'll be no staffing after uh, um, in the later hours of the evening from 8 p.m. To, to, to closing time, and their periods where they're most concerned are residents. There'll be no one to approach. We can leave messages or whatever on their proposed system, but there'll be no one to respond to actual concerns at that time. In conclusion, I'll submit that the, this proposal represents a significant deviation from approvals associated with DA 2152015. In subdividing what was a single commercial lot under previous ownership, the new owners have cut the basement and front terrace off from direct access to the car park, limiting the potential uses of those areas. The residents of the complex should not have to wear the consequences of that decision. The use of a basement as a gym with its very high traffic generation and patronage is not an appropriate usage of this space. And we submit on behalf of the committee and residents that the application be rejected. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Woodburn. Uh, panel members, do you have any questions for the speaker? Uh, Lindsay, yes, it's Heather. Uh, yes, Heather, please um, proceed. Uh, uh, Richard, the, um, you mentioned that you said the previous gym was a source of regular nuisance um, to the residents in, in the, the apartments above. What, what do you mean by that? Could you expand upon what your issues were or what was it noise, was it vibration, was it equipment being dropped or what was it? There, were, there was a, a combination of, it was certainly drop weights uh, was a major issue. Uh, we understand that that's a, that's a common problem with gyms and it's a, 
it's almost a safety first reaction to drop a weight rather than do damage to yourself, but drop weights are a major consideration. So are some of the mechanical um, weightlifting machines, rowing machines and other types of rowing devices where, where the sudden drop weights also cause concern. Um, there was also no regulation of the hours by the former rugby club and we had quite a lot and a lot of the patrons used to congregate out the front door of the club underneath our, our bedroom windows waiting for it to open. So that was a major source of uh, problems as well, that congregation at the front entrance. But it was more the sudden in, you know, impact of drop weights uh, that caused a, a major, major, major problem area. Okay, thank you. Um, any further questions from panel members? Peter? Um, yes, uh, thank you, um, uh, Richard. Uh, could you just clarify, I, I think I understood what you were saying about the parking, but um, uh, that it's already at capacity and that's a result of the existing, uh, the original Dan Murphy's um, uh, business and exacerbated by the um, cafe, is that right? You're muted, I think. Yeah, no, I think. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep, yep. No, the, the Dan Murphy's, um, is the, they're basically the only tenants at the moment. Um, the other two tenancies aren't, aren't, aren't uh, operating. Uh, and Dan Murphy's share of that car space, as we understand from the original DA approval, is 25 spaces. Uh, so they, they need to have those spaces. That leaves 11 spaces. There's 36 car spaces left. That leaves 11 spaces left to be allocated amongst the other two um, tenancies, as I saw on my okay. account. There, there were originally 40 spaces, but that, there has been a reconfiguration and now only 36 um, exist. So 16 spaces for the gym and 16 for the cafe um, poses some challenges in where you find those spaces. Thanks very much, thank you. And I don't, your, your question, sorry, Peter, was in terms of usage, the, the actual assessment report, they visited on a quiet Thursday afternoon just after lunch, but that's certainly not, not representative of uh, the normal traffic um, or normal parking demand. It's quite significant, particularly Thursday, Friday, Saturdays, uh, Sundays, very busy. Last weekend was actually chaotic. Uh, there were queues down the driveway. It was at, basically at full capacity most of the weekend, just with Dan Murphy's, let alone two other potential tendencies. And we understand the cafe development is about to start work. So it's, it's going to exacerbate the situation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I have no further questions of that speaker. So we'll move to Susan Cartwright, um, who's also speaking as an objector. Is Susan there? Mr Chair, I can't see Susan Cartwright online. OK, um, in that case, we will move on. Um, and the next speaker I have listed is Jacinta Stutter. Jacinta, are you there? Yes, thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you, Chair. 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 Fairly terrible echo there. Um, can I just again Sorry, we seem to have an echo here. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Um, I Excellent. just need to remind thank you. you and good afternoon, everyone. In response to your comments, I formally seek permission to address the panel today. I'll be speaking as a lawyer and partner at Clyde & Co and only on legal issues arising from the proposed uh, draft conditions 4 and 47. Uh, as speaking to the letter which has been provided as part of the milestone letter dated 12 December 2022. Okay, that, that's fine. So you're, you're addressing the questions or the legal implications um, of some suggested conditions. That's correct. Please. Please proceed. Thank you. 
Uh, as I say, you have a copy of the milestone letter and my letter. The applicant is, of course, very pleased that the application is recommended for approval. However, the applicant is very concerned about a couple of draft conditions. Uh, condition two in relation to signage, I won't speak to that, but there are comments in the milestone letter on signage. Condition four regarding park, car parking and condition 47. Lisa Bella Esposito of Milestone and Sam Damasi of VMS are here, as you have said, and available to answer any questions, as is the applicant. As I've said in my advice, having reviewed the draft conditions, it's our view that draft conditions 4 and 47 are unreasonable and unnecessary in the circumstances and should not be imposed. We have recommended alternate conditions 4 and 47 in our letter and we would request the panel consider and impose these conditions instead. In terms of uh, draft condition four, which provides a, a requirement for free parking for all patrons, we consider the requirement to be unreasonable and unnecessary for several reasons as set out in our letter, but firstly, the DA meets the parking requirements of the DCP. And in our view, there's no reasonable nexus between the draft condition and the DCP requirements. And in fact, the free covered car parking will likely result in cars being parked in the car park all day, but potentially unrelated to the gym use and will not incentivise people to use alternative forms of transport, such as bicycle and public transport, as contemplated in the DCP. Secondly, any proposed condition uh, should have a reasonably perceived connection with any environmental impact brought about by the uh, development that it's intending to mitigate. And uh, we would say that there are sufficient controls in place um, by way of conditions and plan of management to ensure the amenity is not uh, affected. Thirdly, we say that the proposed condition is inconsistent with the development consent for the site. The 2015 consent already um, provides for the car park and for um, parking uh, fees and a commercial arrangement. We have referred to a couple of cases in our advice relevant to this point. Um, secondly, in relation to draft um, condition 47, which provides for a reviewable condition, a trial period and reduced hours of operation, each of those three aspects um, we consider to be uh, unreasonable and unnecessary in the particular circumstance. And this is because firstly, the DA has undergone a thorough merits assessment. Secondly, the potential impacts on amenity have been carefully considered and addressed. And, and this includes by way of the detailed acoustic assessments that have been carried out and also the plan of management. Thirdly, there are other draft conditions in the consent which are comprehensive in providing for potential acoustic impacts and were informed by uh, the acoustic analysis. There are at least 13 noise conditions already on the proposed consent, plus a detailed plan of management. So to impose these um, onus requirements, uh, are, we consider to be unreasonable and unnecessary. Um, following the detailed assessment and the imposition of um, proposed imposition of the um, conditions. The condition also relates in unreasonable provides in unreasonable uh, level of certainty for any future operator. Um, we understand um, and are instructed that it would be very difficult to find an operator who will be prepared to take on uh, a consent with these sorts of conditions where the whole use could be um, reviewed and the hours uh, limited even further. Uh, and in circumstances where you have a uh, gym, which is located in a basement, um, uh, where the residential component of the site is well set back and where the noise impacts are unlikely, and in circumstances where there was a previous use, uh, it seems to me that these proposed conditions are unnecessarily onerous and unreasonable in the circumstance. Uh, we understand that the potential operators have indicated a start time of 5 a.m. is essential and that this is consistent with other gyms uh, in the area. Uh, we've referred to a case in our advice for under investments um, on trial periods and reviewable conditions. And in our view, the imposition of trial periods and reviewable conditions should really only be imposed where they are necessary in the circumstance, including where the impacts are uncertain and require further assessment. And that's certainly not the case 
year, there has been a very thorough assessment. The potential impacts have been considered exhaustively and provided for in detailed conditions and a plan of management. Uh, we do not think that such conditions are legally uh, required and should be imposed on the consent and um, that both conditions could be challenged. And, and on that basis, we have proposed those alternate conditions uh, for consideration by the panel. And that, that would, my comments in relation to just the high points of the advice, but of course, happy to take questions. And as I say, I have um, Lisa, Bella and Sam here, as well as the applicant for any uh, comments that you would like in response to some of the other matters that have been raised by speakers before me. Thank you. Um, panel members, any questions? Um, Heather? Yes, yeah. Um, thanks, Jacinta. Um, I did read your letter and your draft condition, but I just don't have it in front of me or your alternate draft condition in relation to condition four um, about the free parking. I understand that Dan Murphy's approval at least i'm not sure if it's how it's happening in practice but approval is that you have a receipt um with a receipt you do get free parking to um use dan murphy's that that was my understanding from talking to the council officers and having i had a quick look at the consent um how so why wouldn't the gym members be able to park there for free as well I understand that is the position in relation to Dan Murphy. In relation to um, the members of the gym, I would have to speak to Lisa Bella about. Yeah, That's we're happy for Lisa to answer that question. To, are you happy for happy, me happy. to address? Um, sure, if, you you might, hear me? if you're going to give a general address, then I'm happy because I'll have other questions too, but um, it's up to you. Well, so, sorry, Heather, we cannot hear you. Oh. Well, that, that's Lisa, that's is it? Yeah, Lisa, you can use my computer. Can you hear me now? We, I, I can hear you. So, Lisa, if, if you're yes. if you're responding to that question, please proceed. Um, it hasn't been constant. We'll have to. Okay, we sorry, we've got a bit of echo there. Now talk, Lisa. Go. Can you hear me now? Apologies about that delay. Can yes. you hear me? Yes. I can't hear myself though. I will put my volume up. You put a volume up, Tony. Hello. Is that? Can you hear Lisa now? Yes. Can you? Can you yes, hear me? Yes, we can. I apologise about that delay. Um, uh, I understand the question has been directed regarding the uh, use of uh, free limited parking uh, in association with the gym. Yes. Is yes. that correct? Yes. Uh, we, we haven't contemplated uh, that management. Uh, instead, uh, that the gym members... Uh, <laughs> Firstly, if I can start with the fact that the gym has a capacity of 60 people, um, it is uh, a of what we consider will be a local gym uh, because of where it's situated, uh, catering for the local community. Uh, we anticipate that um, a large number of gym members will jog, cycle or walk to the gym, which is um, consistent with Council's sustainable modes of transport um, and uh, there is also free parking uh, on Brooks Street outside of the hours. Um, uh, uh, it's free, uh, it's 2p between 8am and 10pm and uh, obviously for residential members uh, uh, with uh, resident stickers uh, that that exclusion does not apply. Um, and uh, we also have car parking within the car park. Um, so we consider that the parking within the car park, the on-street supply, as well as the sustainable modes of transport to be acceptable. Um, could you answer about that three aspect though? Like Jan Murphy's is free if you have a receipt. How will the gym people enter the boom gate? How will they get out? 
uh, and why would they be required to pay to be there for a half an hour gym session or is that is that what was co being contemplated? Well, Heather, we I have to say that we don't have an operator at present and that would be a management issue that we can look into with, but the gym members would be accessed with FOB key um, and the FOB key uh, would be linked to, I understand the boom gates and the gym members uh, would, it's not unusual for gym members to need to pay for commercial par car parking. I go to the Crunch gym and I pay for my car parking at that gym. Um, and it's it's not an unusual occurrence. And if the members, but that that is what we have proposed. Um, People go to the beach. Yeah. Okay. I, I just don't think it's actually approved as a public car park, but that's a whole other issue. Um, and you mentioned that there's a small gym of 60 people um, for local for the local community. Could you just clarify? Is that like 60 people max over one day? And there'll only be 60 members, or is that 60 people at any one time? Um, it's 60 people at any one time, and that's linked to BCA requirements, fire exits. Um, so it, 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 there, there would be a capacity of 60 people uh, limited in the gym. Because I think that's different to the council officer's assessment. Um, yes. So that was. So the proposal is that at any one time, I mean, it's possibly unlikely, but at any one time there would be 60 people. So there could be hundreds of people across the whole day. Is that the case? It's 60 people at any one time. It's 60 people at any one time. Um, but we speaking to operators, it's unlikely that there would be 60 people in the premise at any one time. If you look at... Um, some of the operating gyms, there is generally 15 people at, at, in the morning sessions and that gets staggered per hour during the day and then there's another peak period that picks up in the afternoon. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that. No problem. Um, yeah, any other panel members? Peter, Michelle, any questions? Michelle? Um, I'm not sure if this question is um, directed at Ms. Stugart or who, who should answer it, but has there been any approach to the owners' corporation for the for use of the residential component of the driveway in particular, and the proposal to have the shared walkway passageway outside the exit driveway? Was there any approach to the owners' corporation as to gain their permission to have this implemented? Um, I, I will answer that. Um... Michelle, um, as I understand, the driveway is linked uh, to the stratum that uh, is in the ownership of my client, um, and therefore there is no requirement to um, seek formal approval for the use of the driveway because the driveway um, was conditioned and owned and cleaned by our client, gets cleaned by our client. And that was Even part though, of regardless of the fact that the residents, that's their point of entry to their residential parking as well? That's, it is their point of entry. Uh, they because have a right of way. They have a right of way over mm -hmm. the land. Okay. Thank you. Peter, did you have any questions? Oh, look, I, I, I said I didn't, but I do I do have one, and it's probably for um, Ms um, Esposito. Um, in regard to the operating hours, uh, I think it's your client's uh, proposal that the there not be um, staff in attendance between, just that if the hours were as proposed, but between 8 and 11 p.m.? Um, again, um, the, again, there has been a misrepresentation in the council assessment report, um, and we uh, have indicated a maximum of four staff. That, But again, until we get an operator, um, we, we can't uh, confirm when the staff would be, but we understand there would be one staff member that would be present uh, within within the gym. Okay. 
that's that's during the whole operating um, hours, whatever whatever they end up being. During the peak periods, we we would contemplate there will be more than one staff member, and outside of peak periods, there would be a maximum of one, or where uh, the demand once the gym has been operating, there isn't a requirement. There there may be uh, no staff present at those times. That is not, um, that is how Anytime Fitness uh, operates. I understand that's the, um, the management of many gyms. It's not an unusual feature of a gym. And um, I can provide the panel with further information. I, in my capacity as a director of Milestone to the Anytime Fitness account, I also have done a lot of boutique gyms uh, that uh, all throughout Sydney, and I would be happy to send any development consents or um, plans of management associated with those gyms that have been approved. Um, okay, but if I understand you correctly, I, I think you used the word likely that there would be at least, no, you, know, you said, no, you actually didn't say at least, you said um, a maximum of one staff member uh, present during the the off peak, I suppose, if you can put it that way, opening hours. Generally, that's what we expect. But this is contingent on your 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 operator being selected on some sort of basis like that. Yes, I would I would hate to mislead uh, the panel in any way, um, because at the moment we have a concrete bunker with no windows, and it seems to me that the uh, space is best suited to the use of a gym than any other use when the client approached me. And um, we, we don't have an operator at this point. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I've, I've got just one question arising and um, it's either for Jacinta or more likely for um, Mrs. Sweeto. Um, I, I take it your client is, is the owner or lessee of the the whole of the commercial strata. Um, I, I will answer that question. Yes, that is correct. It's the owner of the stratum that manages. So it's in their interest to ensure um, that, like the Dan Murphys and the cafe tenancy, that this tenancy too um, is managed diligently to ensure the other commercial uses aren't disadvantaged in any other way, as well as the residential amenity of the locality. Yeah, that being the case, why is it not possible for there to be a direct link from a commercial car park to the basement gymnasium? Because that would eliminate the issue of the shared way that is clearly less than ideal. Um, and if it's all in one ownership, um, I would have thought it's um, possible, at least, to allow direct access from the car park to the facility. And there is a fire door. More likely fire, to find a tenant. There is a fire exit door that links in um, to the car park, but um, that's, that's we, the residential we, car park, as I understand it. Uh, we we consider that it it was in the best interests of gym members um, and the operations of this commercial tenancy for the entry to be via the Brook Street frontage, which is opposite the, the bus stop, um, which is well lit um, and is a, 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 a you know de designated entry point to the commercial component on, on the site. Sure, sure. I, I, I don't have a problem with the entry from the street. What I'm suggesting is there ought to be an, a way of getting to that point from the commercial car park rather than walking down a driveway. That wasn't something the architect um, uh, looked at uh, as part of this design. As a club, it's always operated like that. Mm. Uh, and as a, as a club, I've been told that as the rugby club operated in that same manner. So it's a long rugby club, The rugby club, as I understand it, occupied the whole of the floor space. So it's a different situation. It's a different tenant. 
Anyway, um, thank you. That's answered my questions. Is there any further questions from panel members arising from that? Um, Michelle? Um, is Sam going to address the panel or can I just ask him a question directly, Mr Chair? Please ask him a question directly. Uh, that's. I was going to invite him to respond to the concerns of the neighbours um, that... Uh, Did you want to go for that first, Sam, before I ask questions? No, I'm happy to incorporate it with your question and ask him to Sam, cover that okay. in his response. Okay. Um, Sam, from my understanding, the residents have already experienced the impacts of the rugby club gym living above that gym whilst it was in operation. Can you please advise of any or autistic um, measures that you have taken to diminish those impacts on the residents above? And, and just for the record, um, Sam is Sam DeMarcy, if I've got that correct, and he's the applicant's acoustic consultant. Thank you, panel members, and thank you, Lindsay, that's correct. Are we good? Yeah. Can you guys all hear me? Yes. I just got some minor technical difficulties as we do. Bear with me one more sec. Sorry, Michelle, could, could you ask that question again, please? Sure. Um, from my understanding, the residents have lived above the rugby club car park previously and have experienced the, sorry, not the car park, the rugby club gym and have experienced the, the noise impacts of that gym whilst it was in operation and have their complaints have been very specific in their submissions. Can you please advise what orchestic measures that you've taken to diminish those impacts on the residents above? Sure, yeah. Well, look, we, we, we have gone to site and actually done detailed measurements within that basement up to Dan Murphy's um, so we can understand, you know, typical weight drops. They're the main issue. Airborne noise in this concrete bunker will, will just not be an issue at all. Um, but there is always a risk that um, weights drop directly onto the ground could impact the um, receivers above. In this case, the residential receivers are not directly above. Dan Murphy's in, so it does give us a buffer. But we've we've done measurements and then we've done measurements that's just without any mitigation. And then we've done measurements of a series of different pads to drop weights on top of those at various heights. Um, it's all been detailed in the second report we prepared, which is normally for CC, but we've done a detailed report in that aspect. So on that basis, we, we, we believe that there is um, sufficient um, information to design um, an appropriate system to, to keep them at ease. Sorry, I think you might have misunderstood my question. I wanted to know what um, measures, what changes have you made to decrease to that room itself to decrease the noise impacts on the residents above? So sorry, that, that is the measure. So the, the main noise issue is impact. And so um, we've introduced pads. And as I've just been advised, the rugby club actually had no pads. So it was a little piece of rubber, which I did take off the ground when, when we did the testing. There was like quite a thin bit of rubber with carpet on top. So we're proposing to add um, a vibration isolated system to to basically the entire area as per the last plan. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and Sam, can I ask you to respond to the concerns about noise from patrons um, yep. entering and entering, entering and exiting the premises, both, I guess, from the street, but also along the driveway um, in an area that's been described as a bit of a canyon for noise. Yes, thank you. I think Richard was asking those questions. Um, look, I, in, in terms of vehicle movements, which is the same as the residential component going up and down that area, we, we've done predictions between 5 and 12 for car movements going up and down. It's well within EPAs and the new revised conditions um, noise limits, so we don't believe there'll be an issue. It'll be compliant. So I'm, I'm not sure why that has been an issue in the past. Um, it's never been raised as an issue to me. It was always impact noise from the gym, but um, we've made um, quite conservative assumptions and our predictions um, indicate that it'll be compliant. So I, I don't believe that that would be an issue. Have your measurements covered the the extended hours? In other words, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, we, we, five, we five a.m. Yes, we have. Yeah, we, we've actually done background measurements for 24 hours over a period of approximately 10 days. 
And they were taken where? In the Dan Murphy's tenancy, were they? No, originally we took them at the front and right at the rear as well. Um, that was done probably 18 months ago by memory. Um, so we can establish the background measurements. Okay. So I, I, I don't believe that that would be, not that you won't be able to hear it, that's a separate issue, but in terms of um, complying with EPA or the conditions from council, I don't, I don't see that being a problem. Um, the, the, is that is that sufficient on that item? Because the second item was was pretty much being answered about noise and vibration, um, which I think is essentially what Michelle um, asked, and I believe that's been answered. Yep. I see Heather had a hand up to ask oh. a further question. I think. Sure. Thanks, thanks Lindsay. Um, thanks, Sam. I just want to clarify when you did the um, noise predictions. What was the assumed number of patrons in the gym? Uh, we. It's not about the number of patients. Uh, sorry, is this for the traffic or for the? Oh, um, sorry, the noise. In terms oh, sorry, of the noise inside. Well, both, both really. Right. So the we we assume sixty. So we assume sixty, and we assumed a a level of seventy five dBA from music, which has been conditioned to be a limiter. So that's like the max. The max it could be. The the max over a period of time, fifteen minutes, generally is for noise. Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so if there's no further questions from any panel members, that I think concludes that item. So I thank all of our speakers. And as I indicated previously, we will um, um, have a separate meeting later to consider the submissions and consider the application and make our determinations. Um, I'll now move to the second item. We have um, two speakers on that item, which is for 163 Coogee Bay Road, Coogee, DA 334 of 2021. Um, the two speakers are Councillor Cathy Nielsen again, so Councillor, can I ask you to address the panel? Thank you, Chair. And I'm also speaking on behalf of Councillor Michael Olive. We were surprised and disappointed that this delightful house had not been identified as a heritage item. It is a little gem hidden behind the dense vegetation and planting. The photos accompanying the real estate sale show a house in excellent condition. To address the heritage concerns, could the panel consider including a salvage plan to ensure that materials, including fireplaces, architraves, skirtings, windows, doors, and remnant components of significant heritage fabric are carefully removed and sold or donated to a heritage salvaging yard to facilitate the conservation of other buildings of a similar period, and consider also including a condition requiring an archive, an archival recording of the property, and then those copies would be um, presented to council, and one of which would be placed in the local history collection of Randwick City Library, and another to the Randwick and District Historical Society. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We'll take that on board. And uh, our next speaker is on behalf of the applicant. I believe they're town planner, so she may also wish to comment on the point you've raised. So moving to our uh, sorry, is panel members any questions of the councillor? No, thanks. No, no, no thank you. Um, so our next speaker is Helena Rubenstein. And Helena, um, I believe you're a town planner representing the applicant. There is no uh, no one registered to speak in opposition to this matter. Uh, yes, I am. Can you hear me, panel? Yes, we can. OK, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, and as you said, I'm from GSA Planning, speaking on behalf of the applicant in support of the DA. Uh, we were of the understanding that only one person could speak on behalf of the applicant. Um, so unfortunately, the um, architect was unable to uh, register. But if there are any specific architectural or, or technical questions that need to be asked that are planning related, uh, we do have the applicant here, Mr. Zaya Jawaro, online and also over the phone if the panel feels it's, it's appropriate to um, ask any questions of that nature. Uh, firstly, we concur with the council officer's assessment and the recommendation for approval and do not challenge any of the conditions of, of consent. And, and the applicant will certainly uh, consider uh, Ms Nielsen's uh, suggestions of removal of items and, and archival recording uh, in any condition of consent. 
Um, the current DA before you is a result of discussions with council during the assessment and subsequent design changes, which have addressed issues raised by the DEEP uh, and council's heritage and planning offices and, and neighbour submissions. Um, the architects have transformed uh, an underdeveloped site into a well-designed residential flat development that is a permissible use, of course, uh, complies with the FSR under the LEP, uh, mostly complies with the building height with the exception of one small corner due to a small drop in land form, and this is supported in a clause 4.6 variation. It also complies with the majority of the built form, landscaping and amenity provisions of the ADG and uh, DCP. And uh, where, are, where there are non-compliances, um, as indicated in the council report, uh, they are consistent with the objectives um, of the controls. The proposal will minimise impacts on neighbours in terms of solar access, privacy and views. And importantly, uh, presents a more attractive and engaging frontage to Coogee Bay Road that is uh, compatible with the desired uh, future character. As indicated in the council report, the revised design um, was lowered uh, by about 800 mil and along, with, and, and along with other sort of design refinements had reduced the perceived scale and uh, which resulted in an improved sort of visual relationship within the streetscape. And this is also supported by Council's Heritage and, and Planning Officers. Uh, the report also indicated that the building would have a negligible to moderate impact on views from selected units at, uh, to the residential flat building to the west. And we would like to point out that these views are across a side boundary, which are more difficult to protect. And the view impacts are, view impacts are uh, the result of a compliant FSR and mostly compliant building height and form that is generally anticipated in council's controls. Uh, other issues that are raised in, in, in neighbour submissions have been comprehensively um, addressed in the assessment report. And, and for these reasons, uh, we believe the proposal is appropriate for the site and, and, and worthy of approval. Thank you. Thank you. Um, panel members, any questions? Um, oh, sorry, <laughs> Michelle, yes, please. Uh, Helena, I'm, would you would it, it be acceptable to you to have an additional condition put in the contract with a mind in, in response to uh, Councillor Nielsen's request about the heritage conservation, that the sandstone that's at the front of the current building be incorporated in somewhere into the landscaping plans of the building? Uh, yes, that's fine, Ms Finnegan. Thank you. Thank you. If there's no further questions, um, I thank you for your input um, and your response to uh, the issue raised by Councillor Nielsen as well. So thank you for that. Um, before we move to the next item, I'll uh, ask Heather if she wouldn't mind leaving the meeting, having declared an interest in the remaining two items. Uh, we'll be in touch to let you know what time we're meeting for the deliberations. So we'll see you at that stage to deliberate on the first two items. Thanks, Lindsay. Bye. Thanks, Heather, for your contribution yep. so far. Okay. We can now move to the third item, which is uh, 24 Cliffbrook Parade Clovelly, um, DA 501 of 2021. Um, at, we have three speakers registered now on that item. Um, uh, Councillor Cathy Nielsen, an objector and a representative of the applicant. So can I ask Councillor Nielsen to uh, address us on this matter? Thank you very much, um, Chair. And again, I speak on behalf of um, Councillor Olive. We both support the officer's recommendation for refusal for all the issues raised. I won't go into them, but we're fully supportive of the recommendation for refusal. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I take it there's no questions from the panel members on that. So, so we'll move to the um, to Natalie Wood. Ms. Ms. Wood, are you there? You're yes, registered hey. to speak as an objector. Yes, I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can. Thank you. And I just right. again remind you that you need to declare any. Um, tell us where you where you, where you reside and uh, yeah. who you are, and yeah. declare any um, do political donations in yep. the last two years. 
definitely no political donations here. Um, thank you for your time today. Um, my name's Natalie Wood and I'm the owner of apartment four, number 23 Melrose Parade. And my apartment is um, uh, located directly at the rear of the development site. Um, and I have had the absolute joy of living here for over 11 years. Um, in my um, discussion today, I'm just referencing today the objection letter from Polana Larissa Ozog, who I did engage um, to um, help us with this. That was um, submitted on the 25th of September. Um, and please refer to this um, document for the view loss pictures, um, pictures one to three. Um, I'm really encouraged by the council rejecting this development as it's clear it's not respecting any of the bylaws and in any way consider it to the surrounding neighbours views and sharing of the iconic landscape. Um, my big issue here is obviously um, I have a devastating and significant view loss um, and this is largely due to the development which is just completely non-compliant. Um, the significant view loss is um, absolutely catastrophic to my living room and bedroom and I will also lose all of my privacy into my apartment. Um, the impact is considered to be devastating and severe to not only myself, but all of my neighbours um, and also my apartment block is three levels high. So we're all impacted as well as the neighbours either side. Um, currently, um, I have amazing uninterrupted iconic views of Wedding Cake Island, Gordon's Bay, through to the coastline of South Coogee, including Wiley's Baths and beyond. Um, I think a big challenge is the 3D montages submitted in the application for the development do not actually show the actual view loss accurately from my unit and they really underplay the reality. Um, and I actually will lose all water views um, up to the land across to um, Coogee. Given the proposal substantially exceeds the floor space um, ratio and is far from compliant, the development um, for this development, there is no logical justification that the extent and degree of um, loss of view created by the new apartment is acceptable or reasonable. Um, I believe that in its current form, the development does not does fail to satisfy the view loss principles established. I guess in um, conclusion, um, the following points um, are that the development is non-compliant. Um, the proposal exceeds the building height and should be amended. There are no anomaly. There are also anomalies and inconsistencies in the calculations, calculations. and we would like this would to, like be, to confirmed be confirmed by an independent surveyor. Um, and the request is that um, the length of the addition needs to be substantially reduced, the internal courtyard removed, and by setting the unit further back um, and reducing the floor space, more view lines could be opened up, which would lessen the impacts to all the properties affected by this and mine in particular. There is also a rendered brick fence in the rear courtyard. It is unattractive and highly dominating. And we'd also be recommending that this be considered in the redesign um, to soften the impact in our, in our backyard. Um, the proposed development is current form is not acceptable and council are justified in the rejection of this and requesting it to be amended on the basis that it causes unreasonable and unnecessary, unnecessary view loss to mine and surrounding properties. A smaller addition and one which is which has been designed to consider view impacts for all surrounding properties would be more acceptable. Um, I'm so pleased the council has agreed with our objections. Thank you so much. And I hope you also support their decision by requ requesting a more sensitive and considered design approach. Thank you. Thank you. Panel members, any questions of Ms. Wood? Peter? Uh, Ms. Wood, I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch the your opening um, statement. What what apartment are you in? I'm, in I'm unit, uh, unit four, number 23, Melrose Parade. So we sit directly behind the apartment, the, the okay. development site. Okay. Thanks yeah. very much. Great. I, I think, Peter, the photo on page 191 of the report yep. was taken from, I believe, that apartment. Yeah, I just wanted to check that I was looking at the right one, that was all. Yeah. Um, no other questions? No questions, Lindsay. Okay. So thank you for your for your comments. We'll move to the applicant's representative, Mr. Anthony Betros. Anthony, are you 
Are you there? Good afternoon, all. How are you? Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak, and I appreciate Council's uh, indulgence um, to speak uh, despite the late uh, addition to the list. I'm sorry, I've got technical issues in Vienna coming today, so I apologise for just being on the iPad. Um, we have actually um, had a pre DA for this application um, two years ago, and we received quite favourable comments from the Design Excellence Panel which is called for some minor adjustment adjustments in line with um, Ms Wood's comments in terms of an increased setback. Um, we do request deferral and could I ask the panel to look at page 181 of your um, business paper, just so I can sort of quickly explain um, what the amendment would be. And I think it, it is in line again with um, the objectors uh, accepted that there can be something on here on the top level. Um, if you have that long section. Yeah, figure 10. Uh, that's it. So the amended design pulls back from the left hand side on the upper level so that there is no um, four storey component, if you know what I mean. So you can see that any height, the building would be completely below the height limit. Um, unfortunately, we provided this information to council, but it wouldn't be accepted under this DA. We, re we are requesting that it be done. And then we'd also be happy to go out and do the view analysis again. Um, the applicant has erected height poles. However, with the problems with COVID, et cetera, um, it has been very difficult to obtain access to numerous properties. Um, so we would request the opportunity to do so under this DA just to avoid a, you know, taking it out and relodging again. It, it just it would seem unnecessary. Um, given that the recommendations that we're doing or the um, modifications that we're doing would be in line with both the Design Excellence Panel recommendations, which are not in the Council report. Um, I'm not sure why that is the case, um, but I couldn't find the DEP comments within your report. Um, it does just make reference to an ADG assessment in Appendix 3, but that's not the panel comments. Um, so given that the amended design we have pulls back in line with both the objectors' comments and also the panel's comments. We don't feel it would be unreasonable or anyone would be severely impacted. The DA has been in over a year anyway. Um, and therefore we can address the issues from the, both the objectors. And you can see by pulling it back to that extent, there'd be absolutely no impact on the coastal walkway as well from the view of the building. I'm happy to answer any questions in that regard. Okay, um, I, I guess our difficulty is, as you say, the application's been in for some time. The report goes through a fair bit of detail of seeking uh, additional information with um, slow responses, if I can put it that way. Um, I'm not sure if the matter were deferred that there would be a timely response to that, and I'm wondering whether it wouldn't be better to um, deal with the matter, the amended plans that you speak of, by way of the review process. Oh, we thought, I mean, I'd mean, hate to start leading with it with all due respect, but really we didn't get comments back from council for a considerable period. Um, and you can see there, there was 17th of June that we respond on the 5th of August. Um, and then we further provided additional information. So I, I would take um, issue with some of the comments in the report. Um, we have been trying, and as I said, the polls are on site. Um, the applicant did pay for these poles to be erected and they were there for some time, but there was quite a lot of difficulty in getting access to multiple mm. Yep. Okay. So, I mean, you understand that we well, clearly can't approve this application oh, given the absence of a 4.6. Yeah, yeah. Just, You're not asking that. You're asking for deferral. Yeah. yeah. Um, just also on the basis that if, you, if you've seen the 4.6s and you've seen the council reports, there's a lot of reference to 18 and 22 Cliffbrook Parade, which have been approved with a very similar but um, greater departures to height and FSR. With the amended scheme, we come down to only 7% over the FSR, which is less than the two others that have been approved. And we're also fully compliant with the height, well under the height now. So it would seem reasonable in our opinion to be able to do this as a, as a uh, application of the current DA. Okay, panel members, any questions? Peter. Um, uh, Mr. Petros, I'm just looking at figure 10 and 
I just need to satisfy myself um, the extent to which you're proposing to modify this to at least ameliorate the um, non-compliances. Um, and I'm not I'm not sure I fully understand what you're proposing. Yeah. Can you thank you, Peter? Can you see the um, vertical dimension of 12.84 meters on the side? That red. Um, Oh, uh, yes, yep. Height yep. dimension. Yep. The built form would be pulled back from the left hand side, which is the water side, to that point. So you could see then the height would only be two stories plus the proposed new level. So where, where it says living, all that would be gone. Um, I think there was some overall height reduction as well, and there's also increased side setbacks. Okay, so would that third story be reduced by the removal of that living space or will it be deleted altogether? Oh, it would just be the area left of the height dimension. Okay, all right. And, and we, if we can also pull forward slightly to the right, that was also proposed. And if you see the photo um, that you referred to earlier on page 191, you can see the benefit of that. It would let you look out and over because the built form would be pulled back. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank you. I mean, we don't have that in front of us, of course. So. Um, no, no. I was, I was just referring to page one ninety one in your report. So. Yeah. No, I understand that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. No questions. No. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Betros, and um, um, sorry. Uh, Natalie, Natalie Wood, thank you for your submissions. We'll take those on board and uh, uh, during our deliberations later today. Um, that takes us to the final item, which is uh, for 55 Denning Street, South Coogee, um, DA 782 of 2021. Um, and we have, again, three speakers registered. Uh, Councillor Cathy Nielsen, um, there's an objector or an alternate objector, but I believe John Kiaglia, is it? Pardon me if I've got that wrong, is present. Yep. Um, and we have Conrad Johnson, the architect, representing the applicant. So if I can start with Councillor Nielsen. To Thanks very address much. Us on this yeah. matter. Thanks very much, Chair. So, um, and again, Councillor Olive and I support the officer's recommendation for refusal for all the details in the report. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, now, the objector, I think it's John Kiaglia. Kiaglia, I'm sorry, I'm struggling with that one. Um, my apologies. Yep. You're there, Got John. It. Thank you. Yep. Please yep. proceed. And again, just remind, um, reminding you to uh, indicate where, where you reside in relation to the property and um, whether you've made any political donations. Yep. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is um, John Siegler. I'm the owner of 76 Denning Street, uh, South Coogee. Uh, in regards to the um, political uh, donations, uh, I have not uh, made any donations uh, in the last uh, two years. Um, Thank you. So thanks for the uh, opportunity to speak. Uh, I'll be speaking on behalf of the objectors uh, in relation to the development at 55 Denning Street. Um, I would like to share a presentation, if that's okay. We did uh, send the presentation in advance, so I dare say you should have a copy. So just allow me just to share that on the screen and just give me the signal that you can uh, you can see it. Give me a second. Apologies, I'm just here at the airport and uh, just trying to uh, get on a flight. So get this here. You can see that presentation, everybody? Yep. Yes. Okay. I'm just going to put that on full screen. Okay. So I want to uh, talk about eight particular points in regards to uh, all the points that we're objecting against in regards to this uh, application. Uh, the first point is in regards to precedent. Uh, we really believe that this development will set an unacceptable uh, precedent in the area. Uh, currently, uh, all the house numbers from number 47 through to 57 Denning Street all have a one-story appearance uh, along Denning Street with various uh, sort of roof forms. The second uh, argument that we want to raise is around excessive bulk uh, and scale. 
the bulk of the proposed fourth story has really just been shifted west just to avoid uh, non-compliance with the uh, LEP height limit. This really uh, increases its bulk and obviously uh, its uh, inconsistency with the streetscape. Um, we really believe that this proposal is really out of character. Uh, it's sort of not too dissimilar to a sort of commercial building when you look at it. And we also believe strongly that there's been no regard uh, for the context and character of the street uh, that we see and have today. Further point on excessive bulk and scale, uh, when you do look at the proposed development from the east, uh, it's obviously uh, six levels of building, and we believe this is very, very excessive. The uh, third point that we want to raise is around front setback, uh, and it's referring to the image that you're seeing below. The bulk is now really located within uh, the front setback. Uh, this setback, we believe, is nowhere near the average setbacks of the adjoining properties and does not comply. There is no other property uh, in this section of Denny Street that has habitable space above a garage and within the front setback area. Uh, if the proposal uh, complied with the front setback control, it would once more not comply with the LEP uh, height limit. Uh, what I was just referring to then is, uh, is uh, shown in the image below. You can see that the proposed developer being the blue is clearly being positioned in front of the average setbacks of all the properties along this side of Denning Street. The fourth argument is around height limit. Just a point just to note, uh, the property currently already has a basement level, which is above ground uh, as it has full height windows. It also has a large unenclosed undercroft area. We really believe that this existing site can easily accommodate the required additional space that they're looking for without breaking the height limit and obviously the front setback without destroying uh, any iconic valuable views that many of us have today and obviously without encroaching on acoustic visual privacy of adjoining and lower properties. We strongly believe that there is a no other reason to go higher other than to obtain more expansive views that's already enjoyed by the property today. And if it was to happen, it would really be at the expense of the existing views of the properties to the west side of Denning Street today. The fifth point is around roof form. Uh, I, I won't read uh, what the definition of a pitch roof is. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you do that. But we note that this development is proposing a mansard roof. And uh, uh, looking at Denning Street, there's no such thing as a mansard roof along Denning Street. It's quite non-existent. And actually, it's quite uncommon uh, in the Randwick precinct. Where they do exist, uh, they're generally in apartment buildings uh, of more than two uh, storeys high uh, when viewed from the street. We did a, a bit of a search uh, of the area. It's, it's fair to say it's quite rare to find this type of roof. The only time we could find it was in uh, apartment buildings that were generally either three to four storeys in height. The fifth argument is around view loss, a very important point for all of us. And I'll just uh, illustrate a couple of homes where the view loss is quite substantial. This is the view loss from number 72, where they'll be losing the iconic view of Wedding Cake Island. And the panoramic views that they will have that they have today will be uh, 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 broken. This is the view loss from number 74. Again, it's a similar story. They'll lose the view of Wedding Cake Island and also have their uh, panoramic views broken as well. And here's an example of number 76, which is my property. Uh, I'll also you lose the, the view of Wedding Cake Island that I have today and obviously have my panoramic view also broken along the east towards the ocean. Here. This, this slide just illustrates the views from number 55 today. Uh, it's just really to highlight what they have. It's quite expansive. Uh, it's quite quite amazing. Uh, it's pretty much 180 degrees of uninterrupted views that they enjoy. The seventh point uh, is around roof and roof terrace. Um, probably two points just to, to note. First of all, if the mansard roof is considered to be a roof, then a roof terrace uh, is not allowed. Uh, if it is not a roof, then it is indeed an extra story and not in keeping with the one story precedent from homes number 47 through to 57 uh, Denning Street. The excessively large uh, uh, roof terrace will further exacerbate the overlooking and neighbouring properties and result in visual and acoustic intrusion. The area, sorry about that, 
people like going to the Gold Coast, sorry. Um, the area of the flat roof is shown in red below in the image, and the large flat roof area with no designated use or landscaping adjacent to this terrace is highly likely to become part of a terrace in the future. And we really believe it's important that any approved plans clearly show any areas outside and the approved terrace balustrade as non trafficable And our final argument is around cross-viewing and privacy. Uh, we believe that the amended plans do not address cross-viewing privacy impacts on the external living areas of properties at number 53, 57 Denning Street, and also uh, below number 2 Pier Street. The existing semicircular balconies completely overlooking number 53 would not be approved under current regulations. And the current and proposed extensions for balconies plus the new roof terrace adversely affect privacy of numbers 53, 57 Denning, and also number 2 P Street. We also believe that no privacy uh, screens have been proposed, and currently planned as an a barbecue obscure view for number 57, which were prohibited under the previous uh, DA. In addition, solar panel panels to the western side of number 57 are also affected by the proposal. In conclusion, uh, the proposed amended scheme does not address the height and non-compliance, the streetscape, uh, front setback uh, view loss, and also privacy and acoustic issues. We also firmly believe it, it is not in the public interest or that of the future development of this area of Denny Street. And we're obviously uh, uh, very happy to hear the, the view from council, which also reviews, reviews the proposed scheme. So, uh, we want to push that the uh, proposed development is also refused as well. That's it uh, from myself. Thank you for uh, listening to me. Thank, thank you, um, John. Uh, panel members, any questions of the speaker? I think it was a clear presentation. No, it's very comprehensive. Thank you. No questions. Peter? Uh, no, th thanks Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Kuchiak. Okay, thank you. So we will now move to um, the applicant's representative, Mr. Mr. Johnson, Conrad Johnson. Are you are you there? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, um, I think I we're still. Like sorry, just uh, just there. before you start, if I may. Sorry, I think we still have a shared screen from the previous speaker, and I wonder if we can get rid of that because I think Mr. Johnson also has a presentation. Right. Thank you. So again, Mr. Johnson, just quickly, um, you're the architect representing the applicant on this, but uh, a question of political donations, if you can address that. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Chair. No, uh, no political um, donations the last two years. Um, and so, yes, if I could address the panel and just share some of our um, images would be great. Um, I'll do that now. Thank you. Um, just before I say, I mean, in terms of the, I can assure the previous speaker that the building will not look anything like the image presented in that. I'm not sure where that image came from, but that's not um, an image. I just wanted to, um, that image is not part of the drawing set or represent the building as, as it stands. So I just wanted to um, reassure the panel of that first fact. Um, so in terms of just in terms of our um, application, just the two things to note that we are compliant with the FSR, um, which council have agreed with. Um, we are also compliant with the height. Council have um, said um, that we are not on the basis. I'm sorry, um, Chair, can you see the screen that I'm sharing? Uh, no, I can't. Sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'll just start again. You you forwarded to us a copy of your presentation, if that's what you're endeavouring to put up there. Yeah, it's it's slightly updated, so I'd rather put that one that I have done up. Yeah, I think that's the updated one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can, the, can, the, can the panel see that the screen now or not? Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay, so yeah, I mentioned that um, 
we're complying with the FSR, which council agree with, um, and, and the height, this is our height blanket that um, we provided council. There is some debate which we're unsure of the nature of in relation to the, um, they're saying that the balustrade breaks the height. Um, we don't believe it does, but sh should we be proven wrong, we're happy to deal with that by a condition of consent. Um, I, I imagine that it's not a material um, breach anyway. So in terms of our, you know, the major um, guidelines in the LEP and DCP, we believe we're compliant with both of those two um, uh, major um, objectives. Uh, in terms, and we understand this is a, a complicated street in terms of um, the, the on the western side of Denning Street, um, they're overlooking the eastern side of Denning Street to get to the view. So we understand the complexities and the difficulties um, by all of the neighbours and we've tried and worked very hard with council and throughout this process to ameliorate um, any viewing in, impacts. And, and equally, I'll say that the viewing impacts provided by the applicant, sorry, by the objector don't um, fortunately don't really represent the situation. So the new impacts are significantly less than what has been represented. And in, in some cases, particularly from 76, we believe the view will be better due to an increased um, view of, uh, num of Wedding Cake Island. So we'll go through that in due course. Um, the, first, the first item I suppose that I, I wanted to discuss was in relation to the character of um, Denning Street and the um, council mentioning that it's a one-story character. We we think that that, although that the, the houses surrounding this this application are in fact one story, it's due to, the, due to the fact that most of them have not been developed and, and over time they will be developed and every house um, virtually on um, Denning Street has been developed, um, you know, in excess of uh, two stories up to three and sometimes four stories. So I think that it's the, the future character of Denning Street is not one story, the future um, Denning Street height is, is two storeys um, and I think that's what, and given that we're complying with the height, that's appropriate for the site that we're dealing with. So, um, so that's that's the beginning of Denning Street, if you can see that, that's on um, um, the southern end of Denning Street and then as you, as you walk down the street you can see that most of the houses are in fact two storeys or one storey with a, um, as an undeveloped proposal. So that's, and we're just walking along Dean Street and the um, applicant is, has done a little bit of maths and saying 74% of houses on Dean Street are two storeys or above. So I think that the characteristic is more due to the fact that it hasn't been developed rather than a um, predominant a desired future character of the area. Um, so the other, the other, so I'll get, I'll just move on to the view studies. Um, the, the other looking that, the, that, that was mentioned, um, uh, talking about the height and the, and the location of this top story, we have pushed this as far to the west as we can while um, whilst achieving a good setback to Denning Street. And the reason for this is um, obviously to, to obtain um, uh, compliance with the height, but also it will this will have also the benefit of, of pushing the accommodation far back from the leading eastern edge, um, therefore minimising any impacts of any houses along Pier Street into their backyard. So you can see the distance to the Pierce Street house um, is quite extensive and the um, and the actual position where you're standing will minimise any over potential overlooking to that due to the leading edge of the eastern side of the house. Um, so then we get onto view studies and, and, and there will be impacts in terms of the height. Um, however, it's due to a compliant um, building volume, we believe, and so, and we've done our um, best to minimise these impacts and a lot of times they're, um, there is a little bit of view taken from the height, but there's also an additional bit of view given back to the residents due to the fact that we're not extending right to the edges as the existing roof is. Um, so I'll, I'll move directly to the one at 76. Um, um, so I'll just walk, because that was the applicant, the objective was talking about that one. Um, that is what we're talking about from their upper story bedroom window, which has an associated piece of living area up there, we understand. So you can see that although there are some views taken to the to the left hand side of the view, the actual leading edge of wedding cake as it extends towards the ocean is actually improved um, by the deletion of that existing hip roof um, and the lowering of that section. So we believe in, in, in that case, which is the primary, which we identified through our um, 
our analysis is the is the real impact of, of wedding cake island from that residence and we believe that the the view is actually better with the with the um deletion of the existing roof um and also i'll just mention anthony betros is the town planner on this one he was going to be um in a medical appointment today but he's actually available to talk through some of these issues so i might just um pass over to him if, he could, if, if that was okay if the panel was okay with that um very briefly yeah anthony uh thank you and again thanks for the indulgence um just with the view analysis uh, provided by the objector shown from the conroe there the view directly out of the properties on the western side is due east and towards the ocean the views shown towards the subject site are actually all skewed so it's not the typical view from within um, the properties or even when you're standing on the balconies you have to go out to the balcony and then look in a north easterly direction um, but i think conrad has summarized it well in terms of the building being within a, a compliant envelope um, 47 has got an approval as well to go up it is um, a single story plus a very large attic which is two stories in scale um, it's a it's a character period um, property and that's been developed in that way but there was, it was still um, two stories in scale so I think I'll just um, add to the um, justification for a two-story scale in the streetscape yeah, thank you okay panel panel members any questions of Mr Johnson or Mr Betros yeah, I do. Michelle. Uh, Mr. Johnson, you showed us your proposed view lost from number 76. Can you show us number 72 and number 74 too, please? Um, sure. That one's 76. Um, as we walk around, um, that's 74. And you can see because um, as you're walking around, you're looking more out towards the ocean and you're not, this house is not um, impacting on the views of wedding cake. So there's a, there's a bit of view increased by the um, setback of the edges, but um, the, height, the, the building's higher. And that's a similar case from 74. That's the upper balcony from 74. Sorry, can you slow yeah. down, please? Sorry. Can you slow down, please? Oh, uh, yeah. I guess just make a comment on on this. These are impact analysis or view impact analysis that have been provided in the last couple of days. Um, they're not something the council officers have had an opportunity um, to look at, and and moreover, they're not something that the public have opportunity to look at. Yeah. Um, and a question, I guess, I was going to ask was um, to do with you know, how they were prepared, basically. I mean, the Land and Environment Court has procedures, as, as I'm sure you're both aware, about um, the preparation of view impact analysis to make sure that, you know, it's the appropriate focal length of the camera and uh, the heights are verified by reference to existing known data points, etc. These don't appear to meet that criteria. Um, so I'm not sure what weight if any, we as a panel can put on these given um, uh, given we don't have that documentation to verify the accuracy of it, um, nor of nor do we have the benefit of the council officers' comments or the mm. public comments on on that. Um, having said that, I, they may well be absolutely accurate, but we don't have the material necessarily to rely upon to prove that. So. We would be happy to do high polls if that was um, going to assist in the process. Well, I guess that brings me to what are you asking? Um, we we do have an issue, obviously, with the height. Um, it's minor, as you say, but it unfortunately, um, case law, we can't deal with it. We can't deal with uh, non-compliance with the development standard by imposing a condition. Um, so the absence of a 4.6 means that we are not in a position to um, approve the application um, at, at this stage. 
So I'm assuming what you're asking is for the matter to be deferred, for you to provide additional information. Is that the well, fu fundamental thing you're requesting? Um, I think so, given the nature of your comments. In, in relation to the, the, I mean, we haven't done a 4.6 because we don't believe one is necessary. Um, however, you know, that, you know, further, we will take council's advice on board and investigate what they think it is. So I suppose, yes, we would propose a, a, a deferral on that basis um, to, and then if, if, if we wanted to look at this in a sort of more forensic detail, as you suggest, Chair, um, we could potentially put up height poles that would um, allow the um, matter of height to be dealt with in a, in a conclusive manner. Yeah. OK, um, just for your information, the council assessment, I think it's in the report. They've they've allowed for a 200 thick slab. They've measured to, I think, it's zero two level, 200 under that uh, to, to get a ground level existing um, and part of the balustrade at the top level uh, overhangs that. So that's where the, the minor height non-compliance arises. Um, sorry, sorry, Chair. I mean, if I mean that is not something. I mean, that's if we were made aware of that um, earlier, we would have fixed it. It's not something that's um, um, material to the application. So, it's it's more of an anomaly in terms of um, how it's being measured, and we'd be more than happy to fix it um, if that was the case. We don't believe it is, but um, you know, that's that's our position on that. That, that, okay. that approach, sorry, is also contradictory to any measurement of height in any case law. Sorry to interrupt, but sorry, I'm just going to debate that point. We can debate that. Um, any further questions or, um, Michelle, I'm not sure, I might have cut across the, your question and the answer to it. No, that's fine, Mr Chair, all done. No more questions. Rita, any questions? Uh, no, I, I, Michelle um, asked the question that I was going to ask because I was interested in the um, the impact on views from those properties on the west side, particularly the possible, you know, potential for them to be improved. But I, I found it difficult to um, to understand fully what those drawings were showing me. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I guess my. The only other question I had, if I may, is why is it not possible to accommodate this additional space at the lower level, down near the pool level? There seems to be an undercroft area. Um, the effect of that would obviously be to um, reduce or perhaps even further reduce the, the views from from um, across the road. But, but more particularly, it takes a, a level off the height of the building when viewed from the ocean. Um, so my question really is, have, is, is there a reason why the lower level isn't better utilised to provide the additional space? Um, yeah, there is a, I mean, the, the, issue, the upper storey space is the main bedroom for the house. Um, currently in that undercroft space, it's been pointed out, um, that's the main entertaining, it's a very steep site, there's not a lot of level entertaining area, so that's the main entertaining area for the house and it um, relates directly to the pool, it's a better to level further down. It's a difficult site because of the steepness of the site to get a con, um, consolidated entertaining area, so the, um, the owner of the house wouldn't be interested in filling that in for a main bedroom because it would render the sort of um, usability of the house quite poor. It's low floor ceiling. And, and the ceiling is actually lower than, I think it's less than 2.4, isn't it? So it's not, it's not really habitable according to, um, you know, the standards. And we can't really okay. get out of it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That was, that was more questions. All right. If there's no further questions, um, I think... I, I thank our speakers on this item, but I thank all of our speakers today for their contribution um, and for their assistance. Um, in accordance with the panel's guidelines, the public meeting will now be closed and the panel move to a further closed meeting to deliberate and vote on these matters. Uh, the outcome from the voting and determination we made available through the Council's website um, by tomorrow. A recording of the public meeting will also be made available on the Council website. Um, I also thank Council staff for their assistance with today's meeting so far. 
Um, and as this is the last panel meeting for the year, I take the opportunity to wish everyone a Merry Christmas and a very happy new year. I declare the meeting closed at 2.36. And panel members, we might uh, 